Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Ask the Expert event. My name is Craig Lamolt, and this is our second event in this series. To kick it off, we're going to be learning about birding. Uh, thank you to everybody who's joining us today. Uh, we'd especially like to thank members of our leadership circle and the RLS members. Thank you for your continued generous support. Before we get started, I want to explain how this is going to work. Uh, many of you may be new to Zoom and we want to make sure that you have a great experience today. So uh, here's basically how it works. You, our audience, are not going to be visible uh, by video. So don't worry about what you're wearing or how your hair is. We can't see you um, and we can't actually hear you, but we do want to hear from you. So in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, you can type in questions. The, the conversation today is really all about your questions and getting them answered. So please put your questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. And then also, if you see a question that you would like an answer to, please give it a thumbs up. The questions that get lots of thumbs up, they move higher and we're more likely to answer them. So please go ahead and, and, uh, and rate the ones that you really like the answers to or you would like to hear from, uh, and we'll make sure to get those answered for you as well. First, I wanna introduce the team behind the event. They're gonna be pulling the strings and connecting with you, but you're not gonna see or hear them, um, but they're the ones who are making this whole thing happen. Um, first, I uh, wanna say hello to Bailey. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us. We're very excited about our birding event and I hope you enjoy. Thanks. And Liz and Sandy are gonna be keeping an eye on the Q&A tab and helping with the questions. Hi guys. Hi, thanks for joining us today. Just as a reminder, let us know what town you're tuning in from today when you ask your question. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for tuning in. We're so excited to have you here today. Great, thank you so much guys for all you're doing to make this work. Uh, and without further ado, I want to introduce our expert, Mark Faraday. Uh, Mark has been the science coordinator at Mass Audubon's Wellfleet Bay Wildlife Sanctuary for 13 years. He's led birding trips for Mass Audubon even longer than that. And his projects include everything from oysters and horseshoe crabs to bats and butterflies, but he's mostly focused on bird ecology for the last 20 years and his research has taken him all over the country as well as around the world. He's been to Kenya, Mexico, Peru, Panama, Belize, and all over Europe studying birds. He's also the week, he does the weekly bird report, which you may have heard. It's his weekly essay on Cape and Islands bird life, which airs each Wednesday on WCAI, our sister NPR station on the Cape. And he co-hosts co Bird News, a monthly call-in show, uh, which is all about birds on WCAI's uh, The uh, Point uh, with Mindy Todd. And we're just so excited. He's joining us now to answer all of your questions about birds. Uh, Mark, uh, welcome and thank you so much for being here. No problem. I'm looking forward to this. Good birds. So, so I, you know, I think a lot of people are joining us today uh, in part because with with you know the last several months and so much of us at home so much i think people maybe are starting to kind of just pause and look around them in a way that they they don't usually even have the time to do and they're noticing birds i feel like i've been hearing a lot from people about uh you know their interest in birds that they're just started noticing things they didn't notice before and so it's an exciting time to be talking about this and i wanted to ask you sort of right now at this moment um What's going on in the birding world? What should people be looking for? What are they seeing? What's happening to birds at the moment? What's happening to birds? Yeah, this is this is sort of a golden hour for birding, right? We have this captive audience. And so those of us who like to promote birding and, and kind of pre preach the gospel of birding, um, this is the time to do it because people are just sort of hanging around their houses. They're, they're hiking more. They're getting out. Um, and so this is an opportunity to grab people by the lapels and be like, Birding is awesome, and there's always so much going on. It's just a matter of paying attention. And, and right now, you know, um, mostly people are experienced birds in their yards. And just in my yard this morning, it was a ridiculous amount of activity, if you're paying attention, because there are so many baby birds right now. Baby birds is kind of a big thing for, you know, the suburban backyard bird watcher right now. That's a really fun thing to watch. Um, you know, Orioles is something everybody loves and, and the Orioles are bringing their chicks around and I have Orioles in my neighborhood. They didn't nest in my yard, but they bring the kids by, which is a lot of fun. And some people like to put out grape jelly for them, you know, seems like kind of a silly thing, but, um, you know, it's a way to, to bring them in and, and show them to your kids, get, get good looks at them. But if you just watch, you can see all kinds of interesting behaviors, parental behaviors, begging behaviors, 
You can see the, the weird plumages that baby birds have with their stubby tails. Um, try, to, try to pick out which ones are the young ones and which ones are the adults. I mean, there's all kinds of things you can do just, just right in your own yard. Um, but I think people are sick of their own yards, let's face it. <laughs> people are going nuts. Uh, you know, and, and things are changing, people are getting out and, and things are more normal. But um, birding has always been something that you could do throughout all of this, throughout this, this pandemic and, and everything else um, relatively safely. And so right now, I'm, I'm very Cape Cod centric. And right now things are about shorebirds. Shorebirds are coming back. Seabirds are coming back. These kinds of cool birds that you would associate with going out on a whale watch, like shearwaters are coming back and storm petrels. Um, but these Arctic shorebirds are now streaming in. If, if you can get to the coast, if you can get to some good mud flats, Parker River National Wildlife Refuge, I'm not sure what they're doing or what access is. You might have to kind of pick your spots and figure out you know, where is accessible right now and do your research. But if you can get to the good birding spots with big mud flats, barrier beaches, um, marshes, shorebirds with this incredible story of, you know, they might have migrated from the southern end of South America to Arctic Alaska this spring in April and May. June, they have and raised their children, very efficient. Their kids are raised, <laughs> they're, they're empty nesters now already, and now they're already in their southbound migration. So things like dowichers and semi-palmated plovers and, and various sandpipers, they're all coming back south. And what's more amazing is, is their kids have been sort of abandoned on the Arctic tundra. And later in the summer, you should watch for those. So in August and early September, they're, they're young who are just abandoned on the Arctic tundra, like, good luck, find your own way to Brazil. Um, they'll be coming through looking all crisp and, and beautiful. Um, wow. For us on the Cape, we really look forward to, to shorebird migration, but there are a million, a million things to look at in the bird world right now, depending yeah, on- Yeah, there's no, no shortage of, of things to look at. You know, I, I wanted to ask you about one thing in my own backyard, um, because uh, recently I was in the backyard in the evening, and uh, it, was, it was starting to get dark and there's these trees in my neighbor's house, uh, pretty big trees around us. And um, I could see these sort of medium sized birds sort of fighting through the, the trees a little bit. And, and I was hearing, it was getting darker and I was hearing this sound, this sound that was kind of creepy sound that they were making. I'd never heard this before. And it was so weird that I actually got on my phone and I started recording. Um, and I actually want to play this for you, Mark, and see if you can identify what the heck this sound was, because I'd never heard anything. So it's, it's, a, it's a little hissy. It's a little quiet. So uh, people might have to turn up the volume a little bit to hear this. And it's going to hiss for a little while. You'll hear it sort of at, at the end. of so it's just a short, short audio clip here. But, but take a listen to this and, and tell me if you know what the heck this is. What was that? It was monsters. It's, I, I, it was, I guess it was just because it was also it was getting dark out and it sort of felt kind of creepy and it was happening all around us. But we're like, what? what is happening right now? Beckett, if you're listening, I was just kidding. There are no monsters. Uh, but it did. My initial impression was like chupacabra or something like that. I mean, that was actually <laughs> creepy sound. Let's face it. it. It's dusk. You don't know what it is. These shadowy figures are moving around in the trees. And... I've been, I've been into birds and, and really all of nature since I was a little kid, um, over 40 years now. And I frequently, like nighttime sounds are one of the most frustrating things because you often can't track down the source. And I, I've heard a number of things over the years I just had to let go. I, I had no idea what that thing was. Um, but that was young screech owls, I'm fairly certain. Really? Um, based on, and it's, th that's not a sound I've heard before. Um, but I, full disclosure, I heard this, <laughs> heard this recording before. I did, I did send it to him to see if, if, but I didn't, I didn't ask, I told him not to tell me what it was, now, just if he could identify it. Before he, before we even listened to it, based on my experience doing the call-in show and just working at Mass Audubon, talking to really all the people that call us with stuff, you have a range of guesses, right, based on all the conversations you've had before. And this was 
one of the things I said, it's, it's probably going to be. But those particular calls, I had to go to this resource. And the reason I'm admi saying, saying that we listened to it before is to point out this really excellent resource called Xenocanto. It's X-E-N-O-C-A-N-T-O. And it's basically a free clearinghouse of amateur bird, record, bird sound recordings. Like 85% of the species in the world are, are on Xenocanto. And obscure things like this, like weird juvenile calls that I have not heard before. I'm aware of other juvenile calls of Eastern screech owls. And this is a really common bird. That's the thing. This is a suburban owl. These are like little suburban nighttime killers that everyone has in their neighborhood. They're going around eating mice and birds and things. Uh, and people don't even know they're there until they become vocal. But they're very, very common. They're adorable. They're very comfortable with um, suburbia. Anywhere there's some trees, uh, they can be. And so it's a little surprising to me that I haven't heard that sound before, but, but that's what that was. I Some love that I actually got a sound that you haven't heard before. I, cause I, I was, it was new to me, but uh, I feel better that it was actually new to you as well. But uh, I hope it's screech owls. Um, if, if it is, can I, do you think I'll be able to spot them? Like, how do I see them? Screech owls are really easy to call in. Um, you can do a pretty terrible imitation of their call. Please do it right now. Something like, It's, it sounds like the ghost of a tiny horse is how I like to describe it. <laughs> they have a whinny call, but then they're really eerie call. And this really um, adds to the aesthetic of the night when these guys are calling. They have this monotone tre tremolo. It's like, it's just eerie. And so if you can, and it took me a while to learn how to do those, get the uvula involved. Um, it, um, but you can, even without the tremolo part, you can just whistle like that <clears throat> and they'll respond and sometimes fly right in. Wow. Uh, and they're around. Okay. Give it a try. It's a fun thing to do with kids. You can call in an owl, watch it, watch it fly in. Uh, yeah, I didn't know I could call them. Actually, I'm totally going to give that a shot. Thank you for that. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I, I wanted to turn our attention to the questions in the in the in the Q and A tab. We have uh, already; they're just flooding in. Great questions. And actually, uh, the first question that uh, a, a ton of people are, are upvoting. They, I guess, everybody wants to know. In when we started out, there was an image uh, at the beginning of this, uh, which had a picture of a bird, and people want to know what bird that was. Yeah, I didn't pick that image. Um, I'm not sure who did, but that's a, a bird from the Indian subcontinent called a red whiskered cobalt that has an established uh, breeding population in South Florida. And if you ever go to South Florida, there actually you can do you can do a paid tour in South Florida of all of the exotic birds, and the American Birding Association, you know, decides which ones are countable. I, I can't even I don't even want to get into all the rules that birders have for whether they can count birds or not. But you can, do, you can do a tour of all of the crazy birds from around the world that have escaped from cages and zoos and things um, that are now established as breeders in South Florida. I mean, there are flights of parrots at dusk in like Broward County, like Fort Lauderdale area, Florida, Dade County. I've, I've been to the Amazon. I've been, you know, I have not seen the likes of some of these mixed flocks of parrots flying around at dusk that you can see in Florida. Um, it, it's just incredible. And red whiskered bulbul is one of those weird things that, that um, is established in South Florida. In, in my neighborhood, we occasionally uh, get an email about an escaped parakeet. I think that's as close as we're going to actually get. Yeah. But, uh, a, you know, a parakeet, there is a parakeet that breeds as far north as at least Chicago and um, on the East Coast, Rhode Island. And sometimes, sometimes they've nested in like East Boston. Uh, we call the Quaker parakeet. It was a cage bird. It's the monk parakeet. It's an all green parakeet. And they can successfully breed um, in, in northern cities. So there's another. Okay, well, we'll keep an eye out for them as well. That's awesome. Um, we have another question I want to get to here, uh, which is, uh, I love this one. It's a question from a rising first grader. Uh, and it's a great question is when we hear a woodpecker outside, how can we find it? Um, yeah. I, I actually find it very difficult. It depends on what they're doing. So when they're tap, tap, tapping away, 
a lot of birders will tell you it can be infuriating to try to find the source because there's lots of trees and branches going everywhere and you hear this tap 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 and looking and looking and looking and it's usually on the back side of the tree so persistence is the answer you just have to you know be, be patient follow your ear they're usually not easily scared so they'll stay there and keep pecking but you just look at look at all sides of the tree and keep trying to hone your your ears uh, and find the source of that pecking. All right, that question I should have said is from the Hood family. So Hoods, just just keep looking. You'll you'll find it sooner or later, I guess. You know, actually, our next question is also a woodpecker question. I think woodpeckers sort of capture all of our imaginations. Um, and uh, the question is actually sort of a, a, a different tone about the woodpecker is how do we discourage the downy woodpecker from drilling holes in the siding of our house? This is actually something that my own family growing up, uh, they used to come and peck at, at the, and I actually, my understanding was that the, um, uh, there was these bees, carpenter bees, were drilling holes and laying eggs in there that the woodpeckers were trying to get at. Is, is, first of all, is that right? And then secondly, what, how, how do we discourage that? Right. And this is one of the classic, like this is such a common question that it's, it's on the uh, Mass Audubon website um, under our like, like frequently asked wildlife questions. Um, what do I do about the woodpeckers pecking on my house? And there are different reasons that they're pecking on the house. Um, one of them is to look for, like you said, carpenter bee larvae that might be in the fascia boards or whatever. Um, and so if you see these long, if they end up making long holes, like lengthwise along the boards, then they were excavating carpenter bee larvae. Other times they're just doing exploratory, like I have a cedar shingle house and they come and they peck little holes on some of the cedar shingles. And I'm, I'm like, do, do you know who I am? Like you have no gratitude woodpeckers, you know, destroying the bird guy's house. <laughs> uh, but they don't listen to reason. They're like toddlers. Um, in terms of what to do about it, um, you know, people have tried, you'll see things like hang CDs, which is, uh, if you're under 30, a CD is, <laughs> no, but, um, you know, because they're shiny and will scare them away. And there's this like, um, um, shiny metallic tape that you can get that people have tried. I don't have personal experience with whether those work. The one sure thing is if, if they're really damaging your house in a particular spot, you'd have to hang up some bird netting and you can get that at any like garden center or whatever. It's just so they can't get to that, that part of the house. You just uh, hang the netting over that part of the house yeah, and just, it's right, just protect that. Not, not going to get tangled in there. Other things aren't going to get tangled in there. Some bird netting. Well, you have to monitor it. Um, you know, I don't use bird netting very often. Um, but yeah, you want to monitor it just in case um, anything gets tangled in it. But um, it's the only, it's really the only surefire way to, if they're really damaging your house, uh, usually it's just so, an annoying thing. Like, flickers are hammering on the metal part of your, you know, they're hammering on your chimney cap at six in the morning and you don't want to be up yet. You know, that's the classic thing. And it's not really much. You could, they'll stop eventually. It's kind of an early breeding season thing. And then they, they move on. Um, but yeah, that's a really common question. Yeah, you know, I saw some flickers recently that were just, um, I, I actually always thought of them as being like up in trees, but they were on, on the ground sort of pecking at, it was, I think it was just after oh, yeah. it rained too, and they were pecking at the ground and, and uh, oh, I, I, was, I was surprised to see them popping around like that. I didn't realize that they did that. That's, yeah, they, they spend as much time on the ground, I think, as they do in the trees. And I, I always call them ground peckers. And my son and I were just watching one, like I'll grab them if there's something interesting in the yard to see. There was a um, flicker on the ground. Um, I think they eat a lot of ants. So sometimes that's what they're looking for. And, and if you see holes in, in um, your yard, my yard is a little sandy. Uh, and so it's easy for them to make holes. A flicker is, is often one of, the, one of the main culprits along with skunks. When you find holes in your lawn or whatever, they're going after grubs or, or ant in the case of flickers. And sometimes in migration, I will, sometimes you'll be walking and you'll flush like six or seven flickers up off the ground. Um, um, coastally, they heavily, and I've had that experience quite a few times. We have a question from Milton uh, asking if you could comment on the species that are disappearing and are moving in as, as, as species tend to be moving north, right? Um, he says, for example, he's in New Hampshire. Uh, they never used to have cardinals, but now they have cardinals there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
uh, you could go on and on on that one. Um, and there are a variety of reasons things are moving north, but um, winters being warmer on average is a very clear observable signal of climate change um, when you look at the, the actual data. And that allows things that are year round residents to be able to shift their range further north because enough of them survive the milder on average winters that they can live to breed the next season. And so the um, cardinal, interesting to hear about cardinals in New Hampshire, we take cardinals for granted, but the turn of the 20th century, that was a rare bird in Mass, like almost unheard of, not a breeding bird in Massachusetts, cardinal. You know, mockingbirds were a southern bird. Um, titmice, tufted titmice. And the more recent ones, like during my lifetime, it was Carolina wrens and red-bellied woodpeckers. When I was a kid, my first red-bellied woodpecker um, I saw in New Jersey. Now they're in northern Vermont um, and southern Canada. So they really march north. And these milder on average winters, along with other things, you know, you, bird feeders and things like that. But certainly the milder winters have facilitated all these northward expansions um, of the ranges of what I call the global warming birds. Yeah. Um, uh, these are fantastic questions. Thank you all so much. And I want to ask also, please, uh, when you type in your questions, let us know where, where you're uh, writing from. We'd love to hear wh where you're at. Um, uh, we have one, this one's from Asher, who's eight years old, and he wants to know, uh, what can I do to attract blue jays? Why won't the blue jays <laughs> eat orange slices that I put out for them? Orange slices. Orange slices. Yeah, they don't seem to be, um, you'd be better off putting out bird nests. <laughs> you don't often hear, I love that question. And, and my, my son, he's two and a half, he loves, that was his first favorite bird was blue jay. Before he was even two, he was obsessed with blue jays. Uh, I think he's gotten over them, he's moved on. Um, <clears throat> but I love blue jays, but most, most people are not huge fans of them because they might know that they're nest robbers. And so, you know, everybody's just trying to make a living out there. Crows, you know, do the same thing, but they'll go into other birds' nests and eat the eggs and chicks. But listen, so do, so do chipmunks, right? Mice do that. Um, it's just, it's an animal eat animal world out there. In terms of how to attract blue jays, I mean, just standard black oil sunflower seed, if it's a, and if you want to make it easy for them, um, you can do like a platform feeder because uh, they often have a hard time with the tube feeders because they're too big. Um, but just like standard black oil sunflower seed, you know, bird seed out um, in some sort of a tray somewhere, you, you should attract, attract some blue jays and as well as like grackles and other kind of big things that most people, when they're asking me about them, they're like, how do I get rid of them? There's, you know, the grackles are coming and eating all my seed and scaring away the other birds and the blue jays. Um, so it's nice to hear somebody who wants to attract the blue jays, little blue jay love. Well, we actually got almost that exact question, but about sparrows. Is there any way to keep sparrows off my feeder? This, from, this is from uh, Gloria. Uh, says, how do I keep the sparrows off my feeder? Um, because they're intimidating some of the other birds, including a juvenile woodpecker. Mm. I assume, yeah, we're probably talking about house sparrows, uh, which are not sparrows. They're like an old world. They're related to old world weaver finches. They, they came from the old world. They're, they're not a native species but they've become this sort of global success story. Like you can find them in cities all over the world and, and agricultural areas and things. Um, they're a big problem in some contexts, especially nest like um, box nesting birds. Like I, I have house sparrows that are causing trouble in our purple martin gourds. Purple martins are big swallows that nest colonially in these houses that people put out for them. And house sparrows go in there and will kill the chicks and things like that. So it's not not really, a, and, and they do that to tree swallows and they do that to bluebirds. Um, they will actually kill the young and get in there and sometimes kill the adults. So they're a real problem. For, I know, <laughs> wah, wah. Um, they're, but they're definitely a problem for these other birds, that these native birds that we like and that we put out these boxes for. And so it's not a species you really want to be putting out the feeding trough for. And but so how do you, I mean, like, I appreciate you, that, that you question out one, there and they're going right. to come, you know, like. One, so one thing is don't, um, don't do the cheap mix that's mostly millet. Um, if you do just black oil sunflower seed, like I almost never get house sparrows at any feeders I put out because I just do, I do black oil sunflower seed in a squirrel proof feeder and that's it. I have very simple 
feeding arrays that I put out. And this time of year, I don't have anything out except hummingbird feeders because I make sure that my yard is a good place for the birds with you know all the oaks and viburnums and you know native trees to provide food for the birds um, in terms in the form of caterpillars and insects and things like that. I don't need to put out bird seed this time of year to see the birds. Um, though I do I do put out hummingbird feeders. But if you are feeding the birds, just do black oil sunflower seed rather than that the kind of cheap mix that's mostly like white and red millet. And the red millet, nothing much eats at all. So you're you're paying for stuff that just becomes mulch, really. Um, so that's my advice. Yeah, you mentioned hummingbirds. Um, our next question is actually about hummingbirds. I never see hummingbirds around here, and I would love to see them. And I think I, I'd like to get a hummingbird feeder to do it. Um, the question is actually, why are hummers so territorial in this area? Um, the males are. Um, so the males are territorial. They, they defend a nesting territory. Oh, I know. The question is about they're 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 very pugnacious in general, um, but yeah, the the males defend territories where they display for any females that come around, but they don't participate in the nesting at all. The males just spend the whole summer displaying. There was one doing it in my yard, just sitting on my deck, and 15 feet away, a male hummingbird is doing the display flight. This. So you know there's a female, you can't see it, but you know I knew there was a female in the rhododendron. Um, the females then go off and have the nest and I don't know how much territoriality they have with between the females. But at feeding stations, uh, they're wicked intolerant of other, other hummingbirds being around. And so they're definitely territorial over food and, and there are tales of them impaling each other. Like hummingbirds are, are, are no joke uh, when they're fighting. And um, it, it's kind of fun to watch. Uh, I've seen them chase, they'll chase any other species of bird. And they're so fast, um, like we're barely, we're, we're like statues to them. <clears throat> Even if we think we're moving to a hummingbird, we're like a sloth, you know, that hasn't had its coffee yet. And they just go from here to 300 yards that way in the blink of an eye. And you watch them chasing, I've seen them chase kingfishers and grackles and like all manner of birds, like including species that are no threat to them at all. I think they, in part, they just do it because they can. They're just showing off. There's, they're so much better at flying than any other bird that they're just, they're just toying with them. <laughs> and there's so much fun to watch too. I know that I should... wasn't a real answer, but they're just fun to talk about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I should have said that question was from Margo. Margo, thank you for that. Um, uh, I love this question uh, from Peter from Gloucester. He says, why do so many birds say the same thing over and over and over again? What are they saying? <laughs> what are they saying? A lot of people you could ask that, that question about. Uh, I, well, I can, think of, I can think of several. Uh, <laughs> but, he, he, you know, they're not geniuses. They're pretty smart. And we're learning more and more about how smart birds are. Um, something just came out that people were sharing, people in the bird world were sharing about, uh, you know, the African gray parrot can, is, can, is smarter than a first grader or something like that. You know, we love stories like that. I think just this last week, didn't I, wasn't there a story out that hummingbirds can, are like really sophisticated counters that they can count really well? I think I remember reading that. I haven't seen that yet, but I'll, I'll be on the lookout for that one. Um, but most birds are very, very simple. Like your, your average songbird, um, you know, might just have a few song types that they do. Some like wrens have tons and tons of different song types and they're very, very sophisticated and the part of their brain um, that controls song is, is very well developed. But then other, other birds, and they, they seem to us to be very repetitive, like Carolina wren, just seems like they're saying tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle. You know, all day long, but people who've recorded them and studied them um, find that they actually have lots and lots of different song types if you, if you really pay attention. Uh, but other other birds, but even like even blue jays and crows, they're not songsters. But if you listen to them, they have incredibly complex communications. They have little whisper songs. Like um, I've had the experience of like being near a crow as they kind of 
as they're walking around and they're giving all these little whispered, really complex vocalizations, like seeming like muttering to themselves. I don't know what that, what that's about. Jays do the same thing. Um, but there's a lot going on in the, in the communication of songbirds, even when it seems like it's just yelling, yelling their name over and over again, you know, like a whippoorwill. I guess that one's pretty, there's not a lot there with a whippoorwill. They're just like whippoorwill, whippoorwill, whippoorwill for hours on end. That's more of an endurance feat, uh, <laughs> complex vocalization. So they, they, are, they are speaking to each other. They're having a conversation. We just don't speak their language. Oh, yeah. They're warning about predators. There are specific calls for specific predators. There's all kinds of things going on that we can't perceive that people like researchers are decoding more and more of that, which is really cool. Great. Um, we have a question from uh, Jeanette in Lexington. She, sa she says, once robin's eggs hatch, how long does it take to fly away? Uh, ours hatched uh, two to three days ago and already they're gone. Mm, uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is, is, that a, uh, is that a sad end to that robin mm. story? Yours were really precocious. Uh, yeah, no, they're gone. It, it, takes, it probably takes 12 days minimum in the nest. And then they, then they need to be tended for a while after that, for many days after that. Um, so robin chicks leave the nest when they're these stubby, dopey little things. And then they're kind of like one is over here in this bush and one is over there. And they make this little sound so the adults don't lose track of them. And the adults just feed them one at a time after they've left the nest. But they need to be in the nest for um, close to two weeks before that. And so the whole, like the average songbird that nests around people's houses, where it often comes up like, oh, this bird is nesting by this side door and we want to use it. And it usually it's about a month, right? From the time they start incubating the eggs till the chicks leave the nest, it's about a month. Like you don't have to sell your house and move. It'll be over quick. Um, and then another really common misconception, people think that birds live in nests because of cartoons. I, I don't know. We just... Like, oh, but the, but the nest, they're going to come back to it. No, I mean, if you look at a bird nest after the chicks have fledged, it is a disgusting disaster. <laughs> and nobody <laughs> it's immediately condemned by the Board of Health. It's full of poop and mites and the eggs of these parasites and things. So that's why they don't reuse them. They go build a fresh nest. And that's why we clean out the bird boxes, the bluebird boxes at the end of the season and things like that. So you don't have to... While a bird nest is, is like technically protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, even after they've used it, they're not, they're not coming back to that nest. What about ospreys, though? I, I, I see ospreys. It right. looks like they come back every year so to that, the same place. Right. Nothing is universal. I mean, the bird world is way, way too diverse for any kind of universalities. But I, I'm mostly talking about like backyard songbirds that people would experience nesting around their houses. Yeah, bald eagles, um, you know, raptors in general, um, ospreys, they come back year after year, they build it up until you end up with this nest the size of a Volkswagen, you know, very impressive. Yeah, they're not building those anew every year. Um, they can, because often storms blow down an osprey nest over the winter, and they come back and remarkably quickly can rebuild that gigantic uh, nest full of sticks. That, sometimes you can see the adults like, swooping in and smashing dead branches off of trees. I've seen them do that here at the sanctuary. It's a really impressive thing. But yeah, you're right. Big, big birds, bigger, long-lived birds um, tend to reuse their nests like, like hawks. How long does an osprey live? An osprey would live, they can live at least 25 years. I don't, I don't have like longevity records in, in my mind, but there are a lot of long-lived birds like parrots, can live 50 years, bald eagles can live 50 years. The bigger, bigger birds and seabirds, and especially big seabirds like albatrosses, can live a really long time, like, you know, almost human type lifespans. We have a, a, a question uh, and ask for a, a recommendation here for a squirrel resistant bird feeder. That's from, from Paula asks for that. And I think that's something that a lot of people would love to know the answer to. Resistant, that's a very, that's like uh, a very carefully chosen word. Not proof. I don't think there's such a thing, right? Right. It's like when you're buying plants, no one, they, they never say they're deer proof because, you know, deer will, will try anything once. Um, I, I've had essentially perfect luck with um, 
they're a little bit expensive, but they're worth the investment. I don't know who makes them. They're just, it's a squirrel proof feeder where there's a cage around the tube feeder that is spring is on a spring. And so anything above the weight of a blue jay will cause the cage to go down over the feeding ports. And I have found that to be basically foolproof, especially if you take other measures like hanging it away from structures so they can't jump on it. But um, the problem is with the ones I have um, is that chipmunks don't weigh enough to trip it. And so the chipmunk will sit on there uh, and just gorge. So they're not chipmunk. But in terms of squirrels, if you don't have a lot of chipmunks, um, they're, they're worth the investment. And I found them to be almost like really squirrel proof. All right. Okay, great. Um, so many fantastic questions and please keep them coming. Get them in that Q&A tab and uh, upvote the ones that, that you like. I uh, want to take just a quick moment to introduce my colleague, uh, Sarah. Hey, Sarah. Hey, Craig. Uh, thanks so much. Who knew that being such a bird brain was a good thing? Uh, I'm having so much fun with Mark and Craig and Owl, bet you are too. The conversations we have on Ask the Expert and across WGBH don't happen without your support. So I'm asking you to become a sustaining member today at $10 a month. And we'll thank you with our soft WGBH t-shirt. The next time you head out birding, you can do so in style. Give a hoot and go ahead and click the link that just popped up in the chat, uh, wherever it is on your screen. And so you can support our events. Uh, birds the word, back to you, Craig. All right, Sarah, thank you so much. And thank you to everybody out there who's joining us today and, and also uh, who is supporting uh, WGBH. Um, it really makes conversations like this possible and also the, the, the great stuff that you hear uh, both on the radio and television. Thank you for supporting WGBH. All right, we have uh, so many more questions to get to here. Um, someone, uh, this is from Don who says, we're seeing a lot more egrets in Massachusetts than we used to years ago. Um, is this something to do with global warming um, or is it a change in the egrets expanding their range to, to or, or is there some other reason why, why are we seeing more egrets? So the problem with this event versus radio uh, is that you would see me googling the answer to things so I can't like I'm trying to figure out like I don't know why uh, I don't have an immediate so have they, you noticed that we're seeing more of them? Is that something been a while, I, I don't know there's always lots of them here on the Cape in, in recent times but I can go through kind of the history because the history of egrets is the history of the modern environmental movement, egrets and other wading birds. Um, really like the foundational story of, of Mass Audubon, the oldest um, continuously operating Audubon society. We are at Mass Audubon. And this movement started in the late 1800s over the, space, the slaughter, like widespread slaughter of herons and egrets at their breeding rookeries um, shorebirds um, to make ladies hats, the, the millinery trade. And so there was some outrage developed over that and Audubon societies um, were formed, federal legislation came about and, and really kind of the modern um, wildlife conservation movement was born. And so certainly they have more protection now than they, they did in the late 1800s, they're protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Um, you know, they have, there's been a lot of habitat loss in terms, you know, we've lost half of our freshwater and coastal marshes um, since kind of pre-colonial times. Um, and so they are dealing with less than they used to have. Um, but certainly over the last hundred years, they, they've had more protections. Um, I think some of the Southern ones, like most wading birds, definitely the, the, the weight of their distribution is south of us. You think of the Florida Everglades and you know, the Southeastern states and through Central and South America are just loaded with wading birds. But it seems like more and more, even some of the Southern species like little blue herons are getting into the rookeries. Like there are some rookeries um, off the North shore um, at Monomoy National Wildlife Refuge and, and other places, there's some rookeries left. Some rookeries were destroyed over the last 50 years. So this is why I'm having a hard time finding, like there's been this kind of, this wild ride for wading birds, like um, um, gains and losses over the years. So it's, um, it's, it's nice to hear that somebody is seeing more of them. I had a great egret fly over my house this morning, which might've been a new yard bird for me. I'm in a, like a wooded suburban neighborhood, like a short walk from, from saltwater. You're never far from saltwater on the Cape, but that was a cool yard bird for me this morning. But Good place to look, um, just, just to plug, a really important project that Mass Audubon did is our State of the Birds 
report, and there have been various versions of it. The most recent um, reworking of the data was focused on climate change and its impact on birds, particularly breeding birds in Massachusetts, but wintering as well. And so if you go to the Mass Audubon web website, you can look up any species and get a full accounting of their trends in the state from different um, data sources um, and just like a narrative about what is going on with them and a map of the state showing where they've declined, where they've held their own and where they've increased um, over the last 40, 50 years. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask you about that. I mean, cause it's, it's sort of um, encouraging to hear the story of the, of how Audubon sort of came about and, and the, the whole story about basically it was advocacy that put an end to the, the, the feathers being used for hats, right? Um, and, and what are the issues now? Like what, what, what is the advocacy that needs to happen now? And my guess is, is as you were, you were saying that, that, that the main issue now is climate change. Yes, um, right. Um, it, it, absolutely, climate change kind of underlies everything, especially here coastally where we are. I mean, sea level rise, um, increased storms, all of these things are, are kind of whittling away at the very ground beneath us here on Cape Cod and, and same for the birds and other, other wildlife that depend on beaches and, and marshes. Um, but everywhere it's, it's impacting things potentially we shouldn't lose sight of good old fashioned um, conservation issues like habitat loss. Um, I get the sense sometimes that the generation coming up now is so focused on climate change that maybe some of the more immediate threats are not getting um, the attention they've gotten before. Um, so just, just habitat protection is still really, really important. And we've come full circle. I, I was talking about the late 1800s and then the Migratory Bird Treaty Act the thing all the bird conservation organizations are trying to um, inspire action on right now is protecting the Migratory Bird Treaty Act because it's under attack by the current administration. They're, they've sort of gutted um, some of the language that um, protects birds from being killed by industrial activities, um, basically now saying, well, if they didn't mean to kill the birds, eh, what are you going to do? Um, so no penalties, don't worry, don't worry about it if you're open pit mine killed 5,000 migrant birds last year. You know, there's, so then there's no recourse now um, under this new imagining, this new um, reworking of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act for something like that. Um, and so, you know, Mass Audubon and other conservation organizations are, are really trying to get the word out on that and um, okay. get people to talk to their legislators. I want to get some more uh, questions here. Uh, we, this is from Barry and Leslie in Waltham. I want to know what some of your favorite locations for birding are, especially since two of their favorites uh, closed down for the spring. I think that's something we're seeing a lot right now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, specifically, they went to Mount Auburn and Plum Island um, uh, that are closed down for the spring. Where, where do you like to go? Um, <clears throat> you know, I've been on the outer Cape for a while and we just have an embarrassment of riches out here. Uh, there's so many great spots. I have two children under the age of three. I, my, you know, my favorite birding spot is my deck. Um, but no, there are some local spots I like to go hiking. But back when I was a freer man, uh, I <laughs> spent a lot of time going to places like Race Point in Provincetown, Nauset Marsh, Coast Guard Beach in East Ham. All of these places are probably under, you know, like the parking lots don't have the same capacity anymore. You have to do your research, like I was saying earlier. Um, some of my favorite places were in Chatham and they've changed because of, um, you know, increased storms and things like that, changing the, the configuration of birders favorite barrier beaches in Chatham, like South Beach and Monomoy. It's harder to bird those places now. Um, so we're having to find other places to go birding. I think people are um, discovering more of their local marshes and mud flats. Uh, we, there's just so many places here on the Outer Cape that we can go and Look for shorebirds and, and migratory birds. Um, I would encourage you to look into very, there's, there's so many sources of information for um, learning about birds, finding other birders, forums, like there's 50,000 Facebook groups about birds. I made that number up, <laughs> exaggerate. Well, there's a lot of them. Worldwide, it's probably more than that. But I mean, like just in like, like there's Eastern Massachusetts birding, there's like town based ones, there's two on Martha's Vineyard for some reason. There's an Nantucket one, there's Cape Cod one. So you can join some of these Facebook groups and see what people are seeing and where they're going. eBird, 
which is an incredible Cornell project that I could go on and on about. Um, it's a free, it's a citizen science project where you can go ask any question about the distribution and abundance of birds anywhere in the world. And you can get like up to the minute real time information about where people are seeing birds in Sri Lanka or your town. Um, and so you can, and you can find the hot spots around you that ha have the most species to offer and click on them and see what people have seen there recently and things like that. Um, I mean, I use eBird every day. I use the app, I enter the sightings, the, that great egret that flew over my house, I need, to, um, I need to enter that. But yeah, so check out eBird. I mean, there's just, there's so many sources of information now. Um, eBird, okay, I'm gonna, I, that's, that's a really great resource. and I really wanna check that. I'm gonna yeah. a, attempt something, Mark. This is, this is, this is a challenge, uh, I know. But because we have so many great questions, and I want to get through so many of them, uh, we're going to attempt a lightning round, okay? So I'm going to fire off questions, and I want short answers so we can fly through a bunch of them. Can we, can we, I know there's a lot to say about each of these questions, and some of them are so good. That, that is a challenge, okay? But we're, we're going to give it a shot. Ready? Okay, right. the, the first one is, why is the junco calling from the top of the tree all, su all summer, all day, and all night? Well, not all night, but all day long. Uh, um, because it, it's announcing its territory and it's trying to attract females. I don't, we don't have juncos here. I wonder where that question's coming from. They, you don't start picking up breeding juncos until, I don't know, like Worcester County and, you know, Western Mass, places with cool coniferous forests. This, that actually, I, I can't see anymore where that question came from, but um, that, uh, we, this is the internet. There could be anybody in the world asking this question. So. It's hormones. Who knows why men, men do the things they do? It's hormones. Right. It's, it's women. Next question is from uh, Victoria who asks, uh, could you talk about where birds go to bed each night once they're not nesting? She said, I watch both shorebirds and others fly at dusk and I'm curious how much are returning to the same spot and, and how they uh, suss out a perch each evening? Yeah, shorebird, I mean, it, it, all birds are different. Um, when they're nesting, one bird is usually on the nest, often the, often the female and the other bird is just roosting nearby. Birds like in the winter, birds like to roost in like dense conifers that protects them from the wind. Shorebirds roost on, you know, mud flats and, and beaches above the tide line, but they also will feed at night too. So every bird is different depending on their needs. Um, they don't sleep in the nest unless there are eggs or chicks that they are protecting. Cavity nesting birds. So think chickadees, bluebirds, nuthatches, woodpeckers. Um, they will spend the night in cavities. So they will use cavities year round. That's why dead trees are such important habitat elements. And I encourage people to leave them in their landscapes when they can. Um, and so they will go to bed in, in something that is like a nest um, year round. Okay, moving on. We got, this is from E. Solon in New Hampshire wants to know, is there an easy way to differentiate between a purple finch and a house finch? Yes, um, it's a house finch. That's the answer. I, <clears throat> whenever you see like on a Facebook group or something like that, is this a purple finch? It never is. House finches are like a thousand times more common. They're very much a backyard bird. Purple finches are around. That's one of the birds that's actually shifting its range north out of Massachusetts. Like, so we're kind of slowly losing purple finches with, with climate change, uh, um, according to the data. But they are around, and especially in migration, uh, late summer, early fall, um, you, you might get them. The females are actually easier. The female purple finch has a really bold facial pattern with a big broad eye line and a, and a dark line you know, through the eye. Um, and they're very different than the very plain female house finch. With the males, there's some structural differences. Purple finches are a little, little heftier. They have like a triangular looking head in profile, uh, big bill, and more of a, a wine color than more of a pure red. All right, from Kathy in Kittery Point saying she's heard mixed messages on this topic. Is it okay to stock bird feeders during the spring, summer, and fall? Yeah, I, um, it's fine. There are problems that can come up. You know, take them down if you have rats. That's become more and more of a thing on the Cape um, and, and like boards of health and things and um, neighborhood associations are cracking down on bird feeders because of rats. And like I said, I don't feel the need to, to have bird feeders with seed in them out in the summer, but I don't, I don't think there's a problem with it. Um, you know, it's fine. And people have studied this and they found, I think particularly in the winter, 
feeding the birds can incrementally increase the annual survival of, of certain birds from um, some folks who've actually looked at it. I'm going to combine two questions here because they're both sort of about birds being pests. Uh, Julia wants to know, is there any way to keep robins from nesting on her porch each year? She says she's tried sheets, which she says are ugly and cumbersome. Uh, and then also um, Norma wants to know, from Framingham, wants to know, how to, is there a way to discourage hordes of grackles from demolishing their suet and seed feeders? Yeah, not really. They, you know, they come through like a, like a Mongol horde and then they don't usually stick around. That, that often happens in late season when there are big giant kind of Hitchcockian flocks of grackles moving through the landscape. They always come through my neighborhood and they might be 2000 strong. And so people are like, whoa, what's going on here? Um, uh, you know, it just, you know, there are worse problems. They'll go away, you know, maybe tomorrow, may, maybe next week. You what can about the nesting on the porch? Taking the feeders for a little bit. I, I don't know. I would have to see the situation. Um, just whatever they're nesting on. Um, if you could, you know, maybe try bird netting, like I said, if there's like a ledge or something that they're able to get on and make that nest. Uh, why, why don't you want a robin nesting there? It's like a nice neighbor. You can check on the chicks and yeah. All right, so here's a question about attracting them. Uh, uh, Carrie wants to know, any suggestions for attracting birds to a bird bath? Fill it, put water in it. <laughs> That's usually enough to work. Having it near cover is often the key. Um, and they often like ones that are on the ground. Um, like we have one that's kind of a stone. Um, it's basically like a hollowed out stone that just sits right on the ground and there's lots of cover around it and that gets a lot of action. But out in the middle of a big open area, it's not gonna get any action. The closer it is to some cover, um, the more the more likely they are to use it. But bird baths are, are great and that's something you can you should do in the summer. And you'll attract things that you wouldn't get at feeders like warblers and things in migration. All right, here's a question. This is not uh, a, uh, a, a lightning round one here because it's, a, it's a really kind of a story from, from Deb in Brookline. It says, a friend had a robin's nest outside her bedroom window and watched the whole process. And at one point when the babies became fledglings, one parent came back to the nest with a long, thin snake. And when one of the fledglings gobbled down about half the snake, the parent grabbed the other end in her beak and abruptly flew away, yanking the fledgling out of the nest where it dropped and then flew away. And she's asking, is this common? And was she using the snake as a tool to kick the youngsters out of the nest? Is that common? Happens every day. <laughs> I've never heard of that in my life. But if you just, if you spend enough time watching birds, there, you see all kinds of crazy behaviors that seem really maladaptive. And that's when you're, you're like, mm, are, are birds really that smart? African greys, I guess maybe, but morning doves are especially dumb. I've seen them do all kinds of things like flush wildly and knock their chicks out of the nest. Um, but yeah, I mean, birds will do stupid things if, if you watch them often enough, but that's a pretty bizarre, I don't think that happens very That actually much. sounds kind of ingenious to me. It was like, you know what, you've been in here long enough, it's time you actually flew. Oh, really? you, the, like it was a, a way to get the kids out of the out of the. Yeah, beach. I think that's what she's suggesting is that perhaps that yeah. was you know it was a way it was like let's just yeah. yank you out of there. Right, you've been out of college for five years. Like I know you're looking for a job, but take a hike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but you, so they, they don't usually. How do they get them out? Like I mean, is that, is that like do they do they push them out? Do they pull them out? Do they or do they just like wait for them to naturally go out on their own? They go out on their own. Okay. Often there's um, like a runty one that's like the, you know, the last one to leave. It might take a couple of days for all of them to fledge, uh, depending on the hatch order or things like that. But, um, I, you know, I think the adults might try to lure them out of the nest by, you know, have just kind of like hanging back with the food to, to move things along. But um, I, I think eventually it just gets so crowded in there in a lot of cases and disgusting that they're like, all right, we, we got to get out of here. All right, so pulling them out by a snake is not not uh, yeah, not, that's not, not the normal. normal. Okay, all right. Um, I think Sheila noticed something uh, that I think I've noticed as well, and uh, she says it seems to me there are more robins this year. Is that true, or am I just noticing them more? And if there are more, why are there? I feel like I see them everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, are they always there? And I'm just like, like Sheila, just seeing them now. I love these questions. Well. Last time I counted, there were exactly the same number of robins as last year. Like, I don't, no one has any idea how many robins there are year to year. So we just have these kind of general impressions. 
Do you uh, have that impression that, that uh, Sheila and I have? No, I, okay. I mean, robins are just incredibly common. They're very successful. Um, they're one of the birds, like lawns are kind of like, don't have lawns if you like wildlife, but you know, they're one of the, the things that has made their peace with lawns. Um, and they nest from Alaska to, you know, Central America. <clears throat> uh, so they're just very successful and they always seem to be very common. They're win they seem to be wintering more and more further north because of, you know, we can make logical guesses, <clears throat> the, the milder winters plus what we've done to the landscape, adding all of these fruiting landscape things like flowering crab apples, um, um, and all kinds of other um, fruiting shrubs, uh, bittersweet, like invasive things, multiflora rose, they love that. So these invasive, all these invasive plants that are um, out competing some of the native plants tend to have fruits that are th there and edible in the winter. And so that's favoring things like robins to winter further north. Um, and so it, it, it may seem like there are more of them at times of year when you didn't used to see so many, but in terms of breeding robins, you know, I, I have no clue. All right. Um, uh, we have a, a question here from Carolyn who wants to know why does the resident hummingbird fly by your hummingbird, Peter, and refuse to stop? Uh, she says she's, it's changed and cleaned every two days. <laughs> uh, and a, a Baltimore Oriole is regular at the feeder. Why, why won't the hummingbird stop? <laughs> You'd have to ask that one. You know, and I'm sure you're doing the right formula and all that. It's uh, one to four, you know, so I do like two cups of water and a half cup of sugar, boil it for a minute and you're done. You know, forget about the red, you know, you don't have to buy this stuff. You just use table sugar from your house and very quick to make. And I, I, I have good luck. I don't know. The neighbors is better. It's a good question. Um, usually once I, once I refresh mine, they start coming back, especially now that my native um, that my honeysuckle vines have, have gone past. Most of the flowers are gone. So now they're, they're switching to my feeders and also my butterfly bushes right now. So I don't how, know. How often, do you, uh, how often do you change it out? In the summer, you should be doing it at least once a week. And mine, like they fill up with ants and, you know, it can ferment and things like that. It gets little, little islands of mold if you've been really bad. But you need to keep an eye on that stuff and make sure you have it fresh every few days when it's been warm. <clears throat> it's a little bit of work, but it's worth it if you can yeah. see some uh, hummingbirds for sure. All right. Well, I wanted to uh, pause here and, and uh, say uh, hi to, to Sarah, who's going to join us for just a second again. Hey, Sarah. Hey, Greg. Thanks so much for having me back again. Uh, I feel like we could talk to Mark literally all day about birding. You can feel his passion, and that's what we do at WGBH and at our sister station, WCAI. We bring you conversations with passionate, thought-provoking people who teach us and entertain us. We hope that you will stay in touch and most importantly, support the conversations we bring you, even while we can't all be together. When you become a member for $120 or $10 a month as a sustainer, we can thank you with our super soft WGBH t-shirt. Learn more about it when you click on the link that just popped up in the chat. Truly, we are here because of your support of WGBH. Back to you, Mark and Craig. Thank you so much, Sarah. And again, uh, this time. what's that? No bird puns this time? No, <laughs> that, first, that first copy was almost as bad as my weekly essays in terms of bird puns. Well, about the weekly essays, tell people where they can get more of your, uh, of your stuff, uh, where they can, they can hear you talk about birds and, and even ask you questions. Yeah, so that's th through WCAI, the Cape and Islands um, affiliate out here. Um, you can hear it from like New Bedford and South Plymouth out to P-Town and the islands. Um, and so that it airs every Wednesday morning drive time, you know, Wednesday morning, 845. And then again at like 545, something like that, the coveted drive time slot. And it's a weekly essay about what's going on in the, in the bird world. And then the second Tuesday of every month at, at nine o'clock on the point with Mindy Todd, we do a live call in show. And all, you know, all of this stuff is uh, available as a, a podcast or just, it just lives online forever um, as everything does now. So yeah, you can, you can check that out various ways. And even if you're not in that listening area, CAI is streaming online, so you can, you can catch it no matter where you are, even live. Um, well, Mark, we, we, unfortunately, we've 
we're running we've run out of time here but there there are just like a ton of phenomenal questions that we didn't have a chance to get to um were you able to answer some of these like on facebook would, would you would you mind uh answering some of these questions for folks uh online uh no i have no time for that <laughs> um <clears throat> yeah i mean and so check out you know mass Audubon, wellfleet bays uh facebook page you know uh i guess we're on instagram and things like that we're on the various social medias um so you can check us out there come come see us at the sanctuary we're like in the pro you know we're in the process of kind of opening up um, but our trails are open um, and the building will probably be, be open next month um, so come see us at some point um, when things are more normal you know check us out online and uh and maybe i'll answer your question <laughs> all right Fantastic. Well, Mark, you've, you've, you've answered a lot of great questions today, too. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. This was uh, just a ton of fun. Uh, I learned a lot. I hope uh, everybody out there watching did as well. Uh, again, uh, you, can, you can check Mark out on uh, his various WCAI uh, uh, programs. Um, and, and come back and join us for more of these Ask the Expert events here at WGBH. Um, we, have, we have a lot more coming. Um, and uh, this has just been a lot of fun. Mark, thank you so much. Thank you. This was great. <laughs> I really appreciate it. And thanks to everybody out there. Uh, hope, to, hope to talk to you again sometime soon. Bye now.